The best views come after the hardest climb. Welcome to Trina Talk. This is the podcast where guests share their stories of pursuing their passions, living a fulfilled life, and empowering others. Each week, I talk with inspiring leaders, business owners, and people with amazing stories from around the world in unscripted conversations as they share their successes and failures. This podcast is all about empowering you to keep striving in your personal and professional life. I am your host, Trina L. Martin. Welcome to episode 133. The topic of this week's episode is Find Your Everest. And this episode is one of my favorite guests from the archives. So sit back and enjoy. My guest this week is Belinda Jane Dolan. Belinda Jane is the CEO of Clarity Group and the co-founder of the One Million and One Project, whose goal is to positively impact the lives of one million and one people globally. The Clarity Group is a leadership and peak performance company. She started the company as a legacy after losing her mom to breast cancer. She now speaks across the globe, helping others to find and climb their own Everest and know that anything is possible. Belinda Jane was born with a disability and told she would never walk, but she decided as soon as she could, she would defy the doctors and do the biggest physical challenges she could. She has committed to climbing seven highest summits on each continent. She has already climbed three of the seven and plans on climbing Everest in 2020. Hello, Belinda. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Trina. I am absolutely remarkable today. What a beautiful day. And thank you for having me on the show. Well, thank you for coming on. And um, good morning, because you are in Australia now. I most certainly am. I'm in the most beautiful part of Australia. It's called um, the Sunshine State, and that's Queensland. So the eastern seaboard of um, sunny, beautiful Queensland. Okay, wow. So Australia is on my bucket list of places to go. So when I am ready, I am going to contact you and you're going to have to tell me all the places to go because I heard it's amazing. And I am, I I just, I have to get there on my short to-do list. (laughs) And we have to have you here. We welcome all the good people here, all the amazing people like yourself, full of energy and abundance. You, you're all welcome. The doors are definitely open. And um, when you are ready, 100%, um, you will love. Now, I'm going to first of all say that you have to visit Queensland. Okay, I'm going to write that down. Go to the Gold Coast or the, the Sunshine Coast, and we'll have to go and have lunch somewhere very, very beautiful. Um, just such a, a beautiful, happy, bright place to be as well, Queensland. So, um, but yeah, then I'll send you up to the top end of Queen, um, NT, Northern Territory, where we used to do a lot of our work with some of the most remote regions in, in the world, in fact. So I'll send you up there and then maybe across to Melbourne and Sydney. My goodness, that's a whole other podcast. We could talk about Australia. Yeah, well, don't worry. I, I'll have you <laughs> penciled in. We'll be in contact, definitely. <laughs> look forward to that and I'm going to hold you to it please do please do you you have all my contact info so we're, we'll be connecting again but today Perfect. we're going to talk about just you being the amazing woman that you are um, you are the CEO of the Clarity Group so tell us about the Clarity Group and how that came to be well, firstly, thank you very much for the for the fabulous um, introduction. Um, I think um, in terms of the Clarity Group, we are a leading leadership and peak performance company. So we basically take leaders and teams from, take them from good to great, from exceptional to extraordinary. So very, very blessed to, to be the, the CEO and founder of the Clarity Group. Um, it's been... A, 
a remarkable journey over the last five and a half years. And it's, uh, we've also founded the One Million and One Project as well, which um, I founded with Anna Tonkin, who is our director and chief happiness officer. So it's been a roller coaster, a whirlwind, and um, I'm so incredibly blessed to to be able to serve in my role because I do see it as um, a role in which I serve people. You know, that is amazing. And it sounds like you're so happy doing it because, I mean, isn't it what is what that's all about is helping others and serving others? Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think one of the, the things, the reason why I think I am so inspired and, and motivated is there's a lot of people in our workforces that are not motivated. You know, the, the research shows it's 58 approximately 58 percent in in the u.s of people and we're not far behind here in australia by the way those figures that are not happy at work um, they're not engaged at work they don't feel enabled at work for, for a number of different reasons by the way and you know we, we could chat through those but one of the things that i think is you spend so much of your time within a work context whether it's your own business or whether you are working uh, with and for someone else. So why not make what you do an inspiring place to be? So, and that's one of the, the reasons why I set up um, IT Group. Um, after losing my mom through breast cancer, I decided how can we make a difference? And, you know, how can we create happy, engaged workforces and set about doing it? So it's um, it's definitely been an exciting time. Wow. So, and, and, you know, unfortunately we have that in common. I lost my mom of breast to breast cancer as well. Um, so yeah, you the same as to you now, what was it now? What did you do before the clarity group? And what was it that, what was that thing that sparked you? You said after your mom's death to actually do and start the clarity group. Um, if it, it almost seems like I have to go back a little bit, which is losing mom was such a an integral part of, I suppose, a, I'm going to use a quite a dramatic word, it's like a metamorphosis. Mm-hmm. Um, I realized that life was so precious, so short. Um, life is for living. And I knew I needed to do something. I've always known that I needed to do something to, um, to, to positively impact the world. But I just didn't know what that was. And obviously, having lost someone yourself, and I'm sure people listening right now, it may be striking a chord with, with people listening. And, and I knew there was something within me that I needed to do something positive. But I was searching for what that was. So I am very, very blessed. I've lived and worked all around the world. I've lived and worked in the in the UAE and spent some time living in Qatar, Oman, and spent some time a little bit in the US, New Zealand. And it was only when we were going through, there was an organization that I used to work for. I um, headed up the education and training arm of the business. And we were going through some changes within the organization. There were redundancies happening. And, and I saw how organize, the organization was treating individuals. And I saw how the leaders were in a position to inspire, to motivate, to guide, to give. And Trina, they didn't do that. Because as we know with our brains, when we're under stress and pressure, we don't perform optimally. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at a lot of leaders and a lot of people under pressure and stress, and their first place cognition wasn't to treat people well. And it triggered something in me. And it was something that since my mom had passed, I couldn't work out what it was. And it triggered something in me to say, we have to do something different. We spend so much of our time within a workplace. Why not enjoy it? And it was from there, and obviously the inspiration through um, through losing mum, that that was the trigger for me to say, enough is enough. Let's do this. Let's create an organisation to enable and empower people to make a difference. And that's where Clarity started uh, nearly, what, five and a half years ago now, nearly six years. 
Wow, that's that's an amazing story. Um, and you know, and I'm big on leadership as well. And I like you, I have seen leaders that, like you said, they have the opportunity to really empower the people that work for them and and and, and help them and you know, put them on a path to success. And many, many times they don't do that. And it's very, and like you said, we spend so much of our life at work. If you, if you tally the hours that you spend at work versus the time that you're at home, you're spending more time at work. And you would think that people would want to make the environment something that their employees have a passion and and, and love to come to, and that it's not stressful and that people feel like they have a purpose. Agreed. And it's, you know, if you think it's what approximately 90,000 hours of our lifetime is at work, that's a lot of time. And I think as leaders, and you know, for anybody listening, and the leader doesn't have to be that person who wears the badge that says supervisor or CEO. Um, you know, they don't have to have a leadership title. They don't have to be a lieutenant or, you know, regardless of what jobs people are in that are listening. Leadership for me is, it's an, it's an honor. It's not a title. I think it's mm-hmm. something where we, you know, people spending 90,000 hours in their lifetime at work. I think it's our responsibility to make that a place, our workplaces, a place that's a great place to be, you know, a space where it's safe, where you feel wanted, where you feel a connection. And that's where a lot of the research is going right now. We do a lot of work um, in terms of happiness in the workplace. Um, and that's one of the, the things that we're finding more and more with our research. The advent of mental health, for example, is a growing challenge within a lot of our countries and a lot of our organizations. So we're shifting more and more towards this model of how do we create happiness, engaged workforces. So it's look, it's a very, very interesting, very interesting space at the moment. Oh, I mean, absolutely. And I would I would love to talk with you further on it because the mental health issue is very big, especially, you know, now, you know, we just had the shooting in uh, New Zealand and we've had yeah. several here in the U.S. It's, you know, and it's all stemming from, it seems like, the mental health problem. Absolutely, yeah. yeah so... Definitely, it's an area where, and it's one of the areas that we've worked on in the mental health space. Um, We worked on a project, a government project, which was mental health in a lot of the remote regions of Australia. So our team went out and delivered a program focused on mental health, um, you know, in terms of creating happy, engaged um, communities and workforces. And we've seen a rapid increase. Um, a, a lot of that is about awareness as well also Trina you know we it's spoken about now years ago people didn't want to, like with cancer we didn't talk mm-hmm. about the big C um, it was something that you know was hushed and whereas now mental health um, we, we talk about it more there's an awareness of it and obviously our rates are in, increasing unfortunately around the globe. Wow so um, going back to leadership and it seems like you you recognize what is missing as far as leadership and in the workplace. Tell me how you run your company as far as the difference that you made and how you treat people who work for you and with you. And that's so good that you said with. And I think that's incredibly important. And it's sometimes the simplest things. So within Clarity, people work with us they work alongside us nobody works for me or for us sometimes you know you might get the odd slip of the tongue when Mm -hmm. you're talking about a team member but the reality is they're part of we call it we joke and say hashtag clarity family and it's um it was actually one of um, the hashtags by um anna who um i've been working with now right from pretty much from day one when i set up clarity and One of the things that we focused on is as leaders, we have to create that place for people to grow. 
And in order to do that, you have to realize that as a leader, it's not about you. (laughs) It's not about you being front and center all of the time. It's about sometimes taking that back seat. We, we obviously it's, it's our research field as well. So we do a lot about social capital, for example, and prioritizing relationships. And now when I say relationships, I'm talking about any form of relationship. So that could be, for example, across to some of our facilitators that we work with. We really heavily focus on that social capital and prioritizing those. So I'll give you just a, a brief example. We have a fabulous gentleman coming on board. He's joining us this week, in fact. And yes, we could have done the induction and that would have been great. But we decided to do something a little bit different and he doesn't know yet but I'm hoping that this podcast will come out before he's had his induction so we're going to go and head out to one of the local restaurants we're going to do the induction there simple little thing balloons so we're going to have some balloons we're going to make him feel like he's having an induction park now some people might be listening so we you know I've got a big organization I can't do that And that's absolutely great. Um, I can't necessarily be at every single induction. But the times that I can be there and the times that I can be present, I will be. You know, research has shown that there's a 30% increase in productivity for organizations where they have strong and close relationships with their um, team members. Now, there might be some people listening to that and saying, well, I, I don't want to get too close to people that I work with Um, you know and it might be you know there's a fear factor there but being close to someone you work with you can still have that you know enough of a distance so you can still be close but still have enough of a professional distance um, between you so I think you know I I just wanted to share that you know it's just obviously a very very small way and we have someone who works with us in New Zealand in fact um, it's actually my my sister um, will be throwing a zoom party for her so we can't be there to you know to welcome her on board so she'll have a zoom party so it's it's the little things about bringing those people together um, and creating a team that has that internal glue so you don't have to be there so I can step out and those glue people as we call them they will bind the organization together without necessarily having a leader there. I love that. I really love that concept because it does it it gives a different perspective to your leadership and your company because we both know that usually you start a job and they go, okay, your start date is this date and you come in and they sit you down at a desk and then that's it. And half of the people in the office don't even know who you are. Absolutely agree. Yes. So I think that is really, that's, that was brilliant of you. You, you know, this new gentleman is just coming to work, you know, work with you. You're taking him out for lunch and you're doing the balloons and then your sister, you're doing the zoom party that as a leader myself and what i found is when you do things like that those are just acts of humanity and letting the other person know that you care about them and that they mean something you in turn get so much more from that person absolutely and it starts off right from day 1 and you know we, you can't do that if you if you're working in an organization where you've got you know 500 team members but for me, it's the little acts that create the ripples. So the little acts of kindness, the little acts of engagement, the small acts of that social capital where we're prioritizing relationships, um, they're the ones that make the difference. It's the when you walk in the door in the morning, if you're a part of a large um, organization, you say hello to everybody, you greet them, you have eye contact, you shake their hands. I worked in a, a, mon- a absolutely wonderful organization in the UAE and I had a connection from one of their old team members oh, many, many years later, five, six years later. And he said, oh, I just wanted to say thank you. And this was on LinkedIn. And I messaged back and I said, oh, what would you like to say thank you for? And he said, well, one of the things that I noticed about your leadership style is that you always greeted people. So I asked him to expand upon it, and he did. 
So when people walked through, we had a large team there, actually. They had to do a fingerprint sign-in, which was part of the, the HR regulations there. So I used to stand by the door every morning and greet everybody and shake hands with them. And it was difficult to do that because, as we know, first thing in the morning, the phones are beeping. I was working in an education facility, so everything seemed to go wrong in the mornings. But I prioritised that. 15, 20 minutes per day where my diary was blocked out. So my EA knew that there was no, you know, even if, a, you know, even if something terrible happened, um, I, you know, I would obviously be there if it was something very, very bad. But if it was just something, you know, something that could wait, I prioritize people over profits mm. because that for me was incredibly important that every, we all bring things with us into our workplaces we all have things going on we never know what's behind those smiles that people greet us with there could be a lot going on so just the little act of shaking hands connecting saying tell me something wonderful about your day yesterday so it's putting a lot of you know the positive psychology but it's putting a lot of people in a space where they feel connected and for him that's what he remembered about leadership which I found really remarkable because we don't know sometimes the little things that could change someone's life and could change them positively <laughs> that is so true you you never know the impact that you're having on someone and like you said you don't know what people are going through but you know we all put on your face to go out you know I call it your 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 interview you you go out to work and you know but uh, many people are you know they may you know smile and hi everything's great and then they get home and it may not be so great so like you said just that small act of kindness could really change someone's day or change someone's attitude or I mean you don't know if they're thinking about you know, suicide or something. And maybe that day you said, hey, tell me something great about your evening. And it, you know, sparked them to say, you know what, I can make it another day. Absolutely. And we, we have the power, each and every single person, both you and I, and every single person listening to this podcast has the ability to create those positive ripples of change. And those small ripples create this tsunami of more engaged, more um, connected, not just workforces. Now I'm on about society as a whole. And, you know, one of the things that we, we talk about here at Clarity is giving more than you take in business. And it's something that I think more and more I've moved to a model of, um, you know, the, the times when I think, my goodness, I could be retired by now, I'm sure, on a beach somewhere or, <laughs> um, you know, for, you know for, for making bigger deals or better deals. But then I think, actually, yes, that could be the case. But also as well, we've always given more than we've taken, which is why we do a lot of work um, with our projects with one million and one, because we realize that giving back, yes, we're a business and yes, we've got to make money. Of course we have. Um, but we've also got a huge responsibility to make some positive changes. And we, our mission is to positively impact the lives of one million and one people globally. And to do that, it takes the small, tiny changes, the one step. Um, I use the analogy, I'm climbing Everest, and I use the analogy of to get to the top of Everest is going to take me many, many steps. It's going to take up to six, seven weeks to climb. But we do that step by step. I don't run up a mountain. And it's the same when we want change with our society and within our workplaces. It's those little steps, those little changes. And we have greatness within every single one of us. We just sometimes don't tap into that greatness because life takes over. Wow. That was so profound. It just, you know, and I think if more people had that mindset, I think there will be less stress that people would go under, you know, that they would feel less pressure. Um, that's, I mean, that's remarkable as a leader that you're doing that and that's how you feel and you want to contribute and, and 
make people's lives positive and add some positivity to it. And I just love that. It's really, you know, it's amazing because me being a leader myself, I always try to see how I can positively impact um, someone else. But I think I'm going to steal your, you know, asking everybody, you know, how was your evening? You know, tell me a positive thing. I really like that. Yeah, and it's like what you're doing with this fantastic podcast. Now it's it's the ability just and, and we spoke um, we spoke a little bit off um, off podcast before. And one of the things that we spoke about was sometimes we never know the impact that we're making. And you know, I spoke about the, the fantastic opportunity to be part of the podcast and what you're doing with some of the amazing speakers. Um, it's it's that ability that somebody somewhere could now be listening to us they you know they may be running or they may be and they may have a child and they're constantly pushing a pram somewhere or a stroller um you know they could be studying for a, a, a an exam and they might be listening to something that you say on you know one of your fabulous interviews and it could be something that sparks that in someone to realize that you know, I, I spoke about having that greatness within and it could be that trigger. It could be that hook for someone. So, you know, I think there also has to be, this is where I also bounce it back to you and say, well, you know, thank you for creating these fabulous opportunities for, for others as well to, you know, to be able to listen and to realize that, yes, I do have greatness within me. How can I trigger that? And how can I, you know, how can I be the best that I possibly can? Oh, I th thank you. I'm I'm very very flattered that you know you are you know recognizing me for that because it is something that's near and, and dear to my heart. Um, just to you know inspire people, and I did it mostly because I had a hard journey and a hard life coming up. And my thing is, if I can help and inspire someone else where they don't have to you know go through the mistakes and the hard things that I went through. That's what I want to do. But, you know, everyone should know that they're worthy and that anything is impossible. You just you just have to work at it. You may fail, but, you know, failing is part of it. And just keep going. Yeah, and I love the fact that you've talked about failure. And this is a topic I was speaking on quite recently. Um, and failure, we need to change our mindset around failure. Because our kind of Western focused mindset is failure is negative. Mm -hmm. What about if we reframed that? What about if we created a world where failure was built in? It was almost part of our model. And I know that's something that we do at Clarity. Um, we didn't do it initially, but we have shifted. We, we talk very much about a growth mindset. So, you know, if anybody's familiar with um, Dr. Carol Dweck's work, um, you know, focusing on having a growth mindset. So why don't we reframe failure? And why don't we talk about falling or failing forward or mm -hmm. failing upwards? Now, you may have heard that concept before. And, and the reason why I say that is I climb mountains. I do extreme adventures. There was one of the mountains that I climbed not so long ago. I crawled. Mm -hmm. And I'm not afraid to say it. I'm no... You know, some of these people go bounding up mountains like gazelles. I was suffering and I crawled. <laughs> the snow was deep. My legs, I, I was born with a disability, so one of my legs doesn't fully function, particularly when I'm fatigued, it doesn't function very well. And I remember crawling. So you could look at that and say, well, you know, she failed. The reality was I didn't. I mm -hmm. failed, but I fell forwards because I kept going. Right. I didn't fail and stop. I just kept going. And yes, my pace was slower, much slower than the lead. And yes, I wanted to give up. Oh, so many times, Trina, did I want to give up. But I changed my mindset around failing. And I didn't see it as failing. I saw it as falling down, struggling, getting back up again. And I got to the top. I reached the highest summit in Europe, wow. which is Mount Elbrus. And that was because of that mindset change. So, you know, that was 5,642 5, meters above sea level. Um, and I changed that mindset with 
it's not about failing. It's about failing forwards or failing upwards because every time we fail, we learn. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure in you know the remarkable roles that you've done and, and the, the fabulous listeners, think about it. Think about the last time that you failed. This is me doing the air inverted commas as well. Mm-hmm. Did we fail or did we just learn? Because wow. for me, failure is learning. And exactly. Every day. I mean, tell me a day where we don't fail. I'm sure there's people nodding now. And every day we fail or we make a mistake. Um, but let's view it as a lesson learned. Sometimes it's an expensive lesson. Sometimes it's um, a very painful lesson. Um, and we've had lots of those as well. And, you know, you get the... You get the scars and the, you know, the battle scars almost sometimes from some of those failing. But wow, what a great opportunity. So we change it now. We don't talk about problems at Clarity. We talk about opportunities. We don't talk about neg- in a negative um, context. We reframe it and we say it's an opportunity to learn or an opportunity to grow. Wow. Wow. That, you know, that is a good leadership style to have to 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 reframe things instead of taking the mistakes that someone may make and making them feel like they're worthless but saying okay you made a mistake but what did you learn from that and how can we do better absolutely and what an honor to be in a and look and you don't necessarily even have to be in a leadership role it could be as a parent for example even in a partnership you know it could be with your husband or wife or partner it could be a family member you know what a, an amazing opportunity because we we have the opportunity to inspire greatness in others and it could be those little things that when someone makes that mistake or perceived mistake or they fail, actually that gets them stronger. Mm. You know, every time we fall, every, I mean, how many times does a, a child or a baby fall before they learn to walk? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hundreds, maybe thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I, I couldn't walk when I was a baby. So I, there was definitely many, many times when I spent uh, time on my bottom. So I failed a lot. But then if you think about the lessons that you learn from that. So, yeah, I mean, leadership, obviously, but we can apply these lessons to so many other, you know, it might be somebody who's got a teenage child that's um, rebelling or they're going through it, you know, a a challenging period and they decide that they're going to take the car when they shouldn't or they might stay out longer than they should really be staying out. But what a, (laughs) and I'm sure that there's parents listening and um, that would most probably say, oh, yeah, sometimes yeah. I don't want them to fail. <laughs> but, you know, what what an opportunity to learn because we've all made those mistakes as well. Oh, yes. And honestly, just listening to you, I, I feel honored to be speaking with you because you were talking about, you know, climbing the summit and, you know, you were saying, well, I had to crawl. Well, to me, that's not a failure because you completed it, whether you had to go slower, whether you had to crawl. You actually completed that. So that right there inspired me because that that just lets me know anything is possible. Like you said, if you put your mind to it and, you know, even though you have some physical challenges, you didn't say, oh, well, woe is me. You know, I can't do this. It, you just say, oh, no, I, I'm doing this. This is what I set out to do. And this is what I'm going to do. And you completed it. And that's what I think many times we forget. There's going to be stumbling blocks along the way. And like you said, yes, we may fail and we may make mistakes, but you got to get up and and do it another day. Absolutely. Failure is inevitable. It's going to happen. And you have to build in for failure. And I think the more we build that into our lives and realize that that is part of life, when we wake up in the morning, you'll have your morning rituals and habits and routines, which I think are incredibly important um, and what sets you up for the day. 
into that. We know that at some point during the day, things are not going to go perfectly. It might be that you're stuck in traffic. Um, somebody might be listening to this right now or listening to the podcast and they're stuck in traffic and they're late for the meeting and then there's a ripple effect. Something may go wrong. It might be ill health and they might lose a contract. Um, a client, for example, in business, um, you know, somebody, a team member may not um, be performing quite as they should. But the reality is we have to change our mindset around that because Failure is inevitable. At some mm. point, it's going to happen. But what's important are the coping strategies. It's what we do when we fall down to get ourselves back up again. That's the secret. And I think mm. that's where a lot of us, when we fall down and we get back up again, is because we've either built the coping strategies or we have been around people that have those coping strategies and we've learned from them. I mean, I'm sure you you have them yourself, ways of which when things don't go quite right, what do you do? How do you get yourself back on track again before we start that negative spiral of thinking, my goodness, you know, everything's going wrong. Um, you know, we talk about, from a research perspective, we talk about internal locus of control versus external locus of control. So what I mean by that is if something goes wrong and we fail, we can either see that as a, or from a learned helplessness perspective. So what I mean by that is that, oh, it's their fault. It's because mm -hmm. of them. It's because this didn't work out. And we almost put that control. It's almost like, I suppose, we're a victim of something mm -hmm. or someone else. Now, that's an external locus of control. Or we have the internal locus of control where we say, well, actually, there are there is something I can do about that. I can change that next time or what I would do differently or this is a new coping strategy that I'm putting in place. So I think that's incredibly important as well is let's build that into the conversation. Um, let's build that into our strategies, our success strategies as leaders, as wives, partners, parents, aunties, um, you know, let, let's build that into our conversations and let's build those coping mechanisms and coping strategies in place as part of our habits. So when we fall down, we know exactly what we need to do to get back up again or crawl back up again. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, getting back to uh, you and your extreme adventures, tell me more about that and how did you get started into that? just doing all of these extreme things. <laughs> it's a it's a very interesting story and I'll I'll keep it a nice short story. Um I was told I would never walk properly again. I was born with bilateral telepathy feet and spent first four or five years of my life not walking. I was in calipers. So if anybody wants to have a look at calipers and if you've seen them from the 1970s, um, giving away my age now, aren't I, Trina? Um, I if you see favorite. them from the <laughs> in the 19, the very, very late 1970s, of course, <laughs> and if you have a look at calipers, these um, boots that they strap around your legs, you have metal bars in them and metal plates. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my, my story is an interesting one because it starts like shuffling along on my bottom on my behind because I didn't want to stay still um, and the doctors really weren't very happy with me because I used to wear down my cast so you had to put like plaster cast on your legs mm -hmm. and I used to wear all those away and I used to wear all my shoes away and you were only supposed to have like one a year or something and I ended up going through three or four a year um, so I ended up costing the and the health service, I'm sure, far too much money. So mm -hmm. my journey started many, many years ago. And I think born of frustration where I was told I couldn't do things. Um, people from where I live didn't do those things. We weren't from a privileged background. So it was very much a, oh, you know, it's not really a girl thing or mm -hmm. it's not really something anybody does around here. And I remember thinking, watch me. Nothing spurs me on more than when people say it's impossible or you can't do that. 
I remember from 15 years of age, I had a picture of Everest. A little picture. I must have cut it out of a magazine or a newspaper. And I put it on what I didn't realize then was like a mini vision board. Um, it really was just a very, it was a couple of dollar cork board. <laughs> um, and it was just things that were stuck on it. Now I obviously know it was some kind of vision board, but it wasn't an intentional one. And I'm thinking, I don't know how. We didn't have any money. I had no idea how I was going to get there, but I knew that very, very, from a very young age, we all have this greatness within us. And I knew that I had to get somehow to the mountain, to Everest. Um, again, I didn't, <laughs> I hadn't worked out the details. It was one of those things that was kind of a wing it. <laughs> I think that's the official term, isn't it? <laughs> Mm-hmm. So didn't know, I didn't have a plan, but I knew that I wanted to do something bigger than me because the world is much bigger than us. And I set about looking at what I could do and um, the process from going from not being able to walk properly. I then took on every single sport imaginable from the second I could walk properly. Um, and obviously, there's still challenges uh, with the disability. However, I can do most things and most people never really know. But I decided to choose something. What's the biggest, most audacious dream I could possibly have? And I'm not a, um, I'm not a cold weather person. I like <laughs> the cold weather, in fact. It's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm almost like a reluctant mountaineer. Maybe that should be my, uh, my new nickname um, is the reluctant mountaineer. But I don't like the cold. So I remember thinking, what's the biggest, scariest thing I could possibly do? And I chose the seven summit, the seven highest mountains on each continent and added to that the North and South Pole as well, skiing to the North and South Pole. Okay, I'll tell you now that some, some of those details aren't yet worked out and I'm not sure how many kidneys I'm going to need to sell to, to pay for some of those trips. But I figured why not set your goals so big that they scare you sometimes? They actually scare you because we only have one life. Well, depending upon your religious beliefs, sorry, but, um, you know, we have one very precious life. And if you're going to do something, then go all out because anything is possible. If I can do it, then anybody can do it. I'm not from privilege. I'm not superhuman. Um, a couple of people that will be listening to this will um, will know my nickname is Wonder Woman. <laughs> we all are Wonder Woman. Every single woman listening to this, and man, Wonder Man as well, we are all Wonder Women and Wonder Men. But if I can do it, coming from some of the challenges that I've come from, then simply anything is possible. I love that. I totally, I mean, the fact that you said and so you know what I'm I'm gonna climb Everest and I'm going who does that <laughs> you, and you're saying well I don't like cold weather but that's what you wanted now of these um, goals how many of them have you completed already I've completed three I was due to complete a fourth actually I was due to be there in February of this year but sometimes we fall we fail things don't work out as we um, as we plan so I now am going to Aconcagua which is the highest mountain in South America in um, later in the year so November December of 2019 so um, anybody's listening to the podcast you can personally hold me accountable to make sure I get up on that mountain um, in 2019 so yeah that 2019 that will be number four of seven and then um, obviously the north and south pole and some ultra marathons and crossing a desert doing a um, 250 kilometer marathon in the middle as well you've got to live life you have to live life (laughs) do the crazy things (laughs) but you know what if if you're not living and if you're not doing something that kind of scares you are you really living absolutely and Interesting that you say that there's, I talk a lot uh, about, um, and I've I've recently, um, we're just finishing off a book at the moment, and it's about finding your own Everest. Now, that's not a shameless plug for the book. That is a genuine comment. 
find your own Everest. I'm climbing Everest. Trina, your Everest could be something very, very different. Um, you know, there could be someone sat there listening to this podcast now who is struggling. You know, they may be really struggling. Or the other extreme, they may be doing incredibly well. But find your Everest. Find that big, scary, audacious goal. And for some people, it might be getting out of bed in the morning. That's their Everest. For some people, it might be wanting to be a rally car driver or an astronaut or an engineer or doing some of the fantastic work, for example, that you've done. It's it, Find your own Everest. Find what motivates, drives and inspires you. And don't worry about what other people are doing. If your goal seems small, your mountain seems small, who cares? Climb the, climb the hill. That's your Everest. Mm. So good. So good. I love that. Now, for people who are listening and, you know, you're saying set these goals, go out and do them. How do you go about setting those goals? Now, we know that, you know, because you're a lot like me. You're like, OK, somebody tell me I can't do something. I'm going to prove them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> watch me. Yeah, watch me. So let's not go too extreme. But how do you how do you sit down to plan those goals, whether it, it is an extreme adventure or whether it's your, you know, your day in your business or your personal life? How do you sit down and plan those goals? So like if someone is listening and they're going, you know, how do I start? What, what do you say? The most important and the fundamental thing about goals, um, and whether you, know, you are a huge goal setter or not, find out what motivates you. What's your why? Simon Sinek talks an awful lot about, you know, finding your why. Find out what drives you. Is it helping others? Is it finding a cure for a disease? Is it helping to, um, you know, work, for example, within a school and education context? What, what drives you? What sets your soul alight? If someone, and this is how I always start, if someone said to me today, Belinda, we're not going to pay you for doing what you're doing. What would still remain in my day? So that's the way I start. So when I'm planning any of the bigger projects or the bigger um, events, we're just launching some, some projects now. And that's how I started the planning process for it. If someone said, Belinda, you're not going to get paid today, what would you be left with? So I brought it back to what would I be left with? What do I find that drives and motivates and inspires and and something I'm passionate about? And look, when you're setting goals, there's the tough stuff you've still got to do as well. You know, if you run a business, um, you've still got to do the admin and the accounts and those types of things. Um, or you've got to oversee certain parts. So that's, that's a not so great thing. But find out, go back to what motivates and inspires you find out what makes you smile so those things now I'm smiling as I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it because it's the things that drive you to be better than you were yesterday so start off there and write down some key words or key phrases and don't be afraid of writing down some really big goals if I think about what I've got ahead of me over the next five to ten years, holy moly, my goodness, it, um, you know, I really do think, wow, it's, it's scary. And I don't quite know sometimes how I'm going to get there. But we can figure the details out. That's the easy stuff with goal setting. Finding what motivates and inspires you and having something to drive you to reach that next level is the hardest part for me. So um, setting out some, you know, some key goals, um, set of post-it notes. I'll share this with you, a fabulous lady um, called Lauren Clement. Um, she's post, she does personal branding. And I remember talking to her about this and she said she shared this great tip with me. So I always like to credit others. Um, definitely not my idea, but get a pack of post-it notes. Write on there the things that you love doing, the things that in you have always wanted to do, whether it's drive a racing car, whether it's trekking the Kokoda, whether it's coming to Australia. I'm still going to hold you to that, Trina. Um, Please do. <laughs> it doesn't matter.
matter what is, what's on those pieces of paper, all the things that you want to do that you're passionate about. Now, some people may get through 30 packs of post-it notes and some people may get through three post-it notes and that's okay and feel comfortable and know that's okay. And then start to rearrange those into key themes. So I'll, I'll just put that into context. So if I was to do that same task now, a lot of mine would fall under very similar things. So they would fall under um, family relationships with family. You know, they would fall into those. There would be a lot um, because I, I live for what I do. So there would be a lot around clarity of one million one hour projects overseas that we charitable projects. There'd be some things there about um, the research that I do. And there'd be something there about um, the extreme adventures because that's a fundamental part of my life. So mine would fall into, well, they have, don't they fall into five key areas? And then from there, you can start to look at, well, actually, what's next? And some people from that activity may find that they might want to change work, what they're doing, and I want to change relationships. Um, you know, there might be some key themes that come out from that goal setting. Um, there's a, a couple of really great tools that I've used for goal setting over the years. Some people like to have it, you know, tech focused, so they like to have it online on their phone. And um, there's a Strive tool that I use there. And some people like to write them down and have them visually or in a diary. But one thing I would say is those people that write their goals down have a significantly statistically have a significantly higher percentage of the ability to achieve that goal mm -hmm. so getting your goals down somewhere now this is where it gets interesting about sharing goals there's two schools of thought and there's the research goes both ways with goal setting and goal achievement there's a lot of research that says don't share your goals publicly mm -hmm. because by doing that you're putting additional pressure on yourself that isn't necessary because you're trying to achieve your goals. You might be wanting to, you know, to go for a, an astronaut position um, with NASA, for example. And by putting that pressure on yourself, the brain then is under additional strain and pressure that it doesn't need. But I say research is great. And as a researcher, I love research. But why not go with what feels right for you? And if you decide to share that goal, share it, share it openly and freely. And if you decide to keep it to yourself, know that's okay too. But one thing I wouldn't compromise on is writing those goals down. So if you're sat listening now and you have a piece of paper near you or a post-it note, or even if it's a something that a, a text, or you might have a child's text near you, just jot a few goals down right now. And it's something that you can come back to a to later date. But I would definitely never compromise on writing those goals down. Mm. Yeah, I find that when I write my goals down, you're right. I do. I'm more likely to achieve them, even if I don't achieve them on that day, the next day or whatever. I'll look at my list and say, OK, I've done this, 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 and I didn't do this. Let me go ahead and do that. Versus if I just, you know, speak and say, oh, well, today I'm going to do this. Well, that this gets pushed aside because of life. But if I write it down, <laughs> you know, I'm more I'm more apt to say, OK, this was my intention for today. And this is what I, I need to accomplish. So I, I I'm one of those people. And I think we talked about this beforehand. I'm a techie as well. So. I have things on my phone, but now I started carrying um, like a journal with me everywhere I go because some, sometimes I, I just like writing more, you know, from my hand instead of putting it, you know, in a phone. I don't know why it is. Call me crazy. So I will actually open up my journal and write it. And I think maybe I like seeing my handwriting and it, it puts it out on paper and I guess it makes it more real for me. I don't know. Um, but because people go, well, you're a techie. Why are you carrying around a journal? Well, sometimes I just like to write. And it's what works for you. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing as well. There is there's so many we're bombarded with all of these messages. You know, each and every single day we're bombarded with, with so many messages like go past us of what we should do and what's better for us and what this person is doing and what this celebrities doing and, and all of these messaging when the reality is it's got to be what works for you 
And if it's writing, because the physical act of writing is also incredibly good um, in terms of from a brain context as well. Um, so if that works for you, you know, if you think about it, we have up to 50,000 plus thoughts per day that go through our brain. And that could be 50,000 goals for some people <laughs> um, mm-hmm. or 50,000 ideas or concepts. And so that's a lot of thoughts going through our brain. Our brains can't multitask. So as much as um, we like to think um, that we can, um, we can't. We only switch between tasks. So if if by wanting to achieve those goals, you decide, OK, I'm going to write them down and do that physical act, you're actually then transposing that and putting it out almost for yourself, not necessarily for others. Nobody has to see those goals. But the physical act of writing, and I'm like you, Trina, I've actually done, I'm a techie when it comes to those types of things. Um, but I also have my Wonder Woman diary, funnily enough. <laughs> um, I'm actually looking at it now. It's a bright red Wonder Woman diary. And I write a lot of notes, ideas, concepts in there as well. And then I'll revisit them. So as part of my habits, I go back at the end of the day and I'll go back and I'll revisit those. Um, so, you know, for some people listening, just if you've tried something that's not worked, or if you find that you're not achieving those goals, sometimes we have, it's something uh, fantastic in human behavior that we often overestimate our abilities. And that's a self-protection mechanism as well as part of the brain to, you know, to protect us. Um, you know, it goes back to, um, to, to years gone by where, you know, we needed to protect ourselves far more than we do now. So a lot of the time when people don't achieve those goals, it's often that we set maybe too many goals. And think, oh, we are wonder women or wonder men. We can achieve, you know, those 77 things on our to-do list. We can achieve them all by lunchtime. Mm-hmm. The reality is we can't. And we're setting ourselves up for failure, but not a positive failure, though. So um, I love the fact that you've gone back to, you know, the, the writing, me too. And I'm finding a lot more success with it. So I tried the other options and I still dip in and out of those. But mm-hmm. now I write. Yeah. I love it, too. <laughs> it, it, you know, it is. And and I was sitting here, you know, while you're talking, I'm thinking, I'm like, yeah, why do I like to write? But you're right. I think it's therapeutic and totally off topic. But I have to laugh because you mentioned Wonder Woman. I'm a child of the 70s as well. And Wonder Woman is <laughs> my favorite show. And I always wanted to be Wonder Woman. You know, I needed the gold bracelets and the red boots. So just so you know, so, you know. <laughs> Well, you'd laugh right now. I've actually damaged both of my wrists. I've, um, I'm in two casts, um, two casts on both of my wrists at the moment as I'm looking at them. And I thought, I'm not happy. One was gray, one was red. <laughs> and I thought, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it, Wonder Woman. So I went out and bought some gold spray paint and I sprayed <laughs> them Wonder Woman gold. And I spoke on uh, at a, a very big event recently for International Women's Day. And um, what was really amusing, because I couldn't fit into a jacket, obviously, because they're mm-hmm. quite bulky. I had to wear, uh, you'll be familiar with the capes, you know, the jackets mm-hmm. with no arms. Mm-hmm. But it looked like a cape. It was red. And I had gold. Right? Well, I had people coming up and saying, I love the outfit. <laughs> I'm sorry? I love you've gone with the whole Wonder Woman theme. And, I, and then they tapped my wrists and realized that they were actually casts. I was actually immobilized in, in two casts on my wrists. And um, so, look, if you're, going to, if you're going to do something, then at least go full on sometimes. And, um, yeah, for anybody that has a cast on their arms, go and spray Wonder Woman gold. Oh, yes. I mean, I, I love that. You're a fashion statement, even though you have cast on your arm. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was more of a, a, a mental process for me knowing that my wrists have failed but I'm not going to fail <laughs> that is okay so yeah so I have to come to Australia now because we definitely we we have to meet because this is just too funny <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely do I'll take you to some Wonder Woman haunts now the only thing the only the, the thing I will say are you a runner do you run at all you know, I used to I don't anymore because I have a bad back and knees so I don't run anymore. I was going to say we can walk then because if there's any events on, I run all the events dressed as Wonder Woman. So I would say that if there's an event on whilst you're here, we'll go. We can walk it. We don't have to run it. Um, But 
there may be a splash of Wonder Woman that we may need to wear. Oh, I'm I'm down for that. And and I walk I walk pretty fast. So um yeah, it, it's it's like a, a light jog, but I can walk pretty fast, but I'm I'm down for the Wonder Woman. I am. You're most probably your walking will be as fast as my running because I'm no Hussein Bolt, I tell you. <laughs> oh I can run forever, wind me up and I'll run forever, but I'm not a sprinter. So I oh. think your walk pace will most probably be my running pace. Oh, funny. Okay, Belinda, we're going we're gonna to have to kind of, because we're, we're going on forever and I know you're starting your day <laughs> and I'm ending That's mine. So <laughs> but let's, okay, let's get into the questions. And um, we're going to go on from there. So who or what motivates you? Everything that happens that is not so positive motivates me. Every single aspect of every day motivates me. I use it as a driving force in everything that I do, particularly the challenges. I love those. Oh, okay. What demotivates you? Good question. I'll be honest, being around people that are not motivated. Very good. Okay. When was a time that something was said or done to hurt you, but it worked for your good? (laughs) You don't have 16 years worth of conversations that I could have with those. Um, I would say there's been many occasions over the years where things have been said um, that potentially could demotivate, but I've decided to use them to the advantage and know that's a reflection of those individuals, not of me. Oh, man, that was amazing. That's good. Um, What is your fear? I don't have one. I use fear to motivate me. I don't particularly like heights. So I go to extreme heights. I don't, I don't particularly like water. So I went to go diving. So I use fear in another sense that if I'm scared of something, I'll go and face it head on. Okay. So in that sense, I don't really have any true fears. I have things that I don't like a lot, and then I go and do them to stop me fearing them. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Is there, a, is there a time when you wish you had done something that you didn't? Yes. Um, There's many times, but I I try not to live with regrets. I try to make sure that I change them for next time. So there's opportunities that I've not jumped at or there's opportunities that I've taken that I think, oh, I really shouldn't have done. Um, But one thing I have learned in all of that is the limbic brain, your gut instinct. If it doesn't feel right, because something's not right. Mm. Okay. Now this one is, is there a time that you wish you had not done something? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, working with people, we, we're very selective who we now work with and choosing to work with people that we perhaps shouldn't have worked with. Um, but again, we've turned that and said, well, that's an opportunity for us to grow as an organization. So yes. There's been many of those occasions over the years, <laughs> many. Okay. What is your definition of success? Success is what you define for yourself. It's not looking external about others. Success is being the best you possibly can be. It is driving others to be the best they can be. Um, a very, very interesting question. I see success as the ability to inspire, to to lead, and to to give more than you take. That's what I see as success. Okay. How do you recharge? (laughs) I run ultra marathons and I do very extreme events. But the balance of that, I also have very strong habits and rituals around yoga, Pilates, meditation. Um, so for the flip side, I have two extremes. The extreme would be doing all of the, the extreme events, but I also have the flip side, which is making sure that I get really good sleep as well. That's incredibly important. Okay. What are you awesome at? <laughs> 
Good question. Um, hopefully inspiring others. I would like to think that I'm awesome at inspiring, motivating others to reach their full potential and to see that they have got greatness within. I hope that's what I'm awesome at. Okay. Okay. So what legacy do you want to leave? To give more than you take in life, to realize that the world is far greater than you, to look at the privilege that we have to be alive, to be breathing, and to use that privilege for purpose. Um, we use a lot of our profits with purpose. So to give back, to find something or someone that is far beyond you and far beyond outside of your own self and being there for others. I think that's that's the legacy that I would like to leave is knowing that I've given more than I've taken in life. Okay, so we're done with the questions, but what is one motivational takeaway that you would like to leave with the listeners? Go back to the post-it notes that we spoke about earlier in the podcast and find your Everest. Almost hit the reset button if you've been having a challenging time or if you want to do more than you did yesterday or you know that there's greatness within, but you just don't know how to trigger it. Go back to those post-it notes. Find what makes you smile. Find if someone said you have no money attached, no monetary value attached to that job or to that activity and go and find it. So. Get your pen and your post-it notes, or if you're a techie, your phone, and go back and find your Everest. Wow. Okay, Belinda, tell the listeners where they can connect with you. Oh, of course. I would love to connect. Um, They can connect um, through our website, claritygroup.com, and we're clarity with an I, not a Y, because we're special at the end. Um, LinkedIn, and also Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Belinda Jane, Wonder Woman. Yeah, connect, reach out, say hi. Um, you know, there's no borders these days to connection with people, and connections cost nothing. Um, they're interactions between people, and hopefully, we can all inspire each and every one of us, you know, to find that greatness within. So please do connect and reach out. We'd love to hear from your listeners. All right. Well, I thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for for using this as a vehicle to inspire and motivate others. And I feel very honored and blessed to be part of the podcast. So I also want to say a huge thank you. And a, I can't clap very well because I'm in cast, but there's a huge round of applause also to you for the wonderful work you do. And, and thank you for every each and every single person listening at home or in the car or whilst they're out running. And um, yeah, I absolutely want to say find your Everest and have the most abundant and beautiful day. If you like Trina Talk Podcast, please don't forget to go out to iTunes and rate it five stars and leave a review. Also, who else in your life do you know that needs some motivation and inspiration in their lives? Don't forget to share Trina Talk with them. I hope you have a great week. And remember, if you change your mindset, you can change your life. Keep striving because success is a journey, not a destination.